Hello and welcome to the Hollywood Dream Podcast, the podcast where we talk to film and TV professionals about their journey in Hollywood and their own Hollywood dreams, whatever those dreams might be to them. My name is Johnny. I am a writer and I am a filmmaker and live in New York City. Uh, and I usually record this podcast from my small studio apartment in New York. So please excuse any sirens that you might hear in the background. I try my best to clear all the background noise, but somehow, some way, those sirens find their way into an episode or two. So I apologize in advance. The film and TV industry has a lot of layers. Uh, it is not just the actors and the people behind the cameras. There are lawyers, there are accountants, there are publicists, nannies, etc., etc. It takes a village. Just like it takes a village to raise a child, it usually takes a small village to make a movie. And once the movie is done, it goes out into the world for people to enjoy and consume and critique. I mean, everyone is a critic nowadays with Twitter and TikTok and YouTube, but there are a small, well, not so small anymore, but there are people whose sole job and profession is to tell the general public if a movie is good or not. Those people are film critics. They carefully evaluate and analyze a film and let us, the general public, know if a movie is worth the hype, if it's worth your time, etc., etc. Film criticism is an integral part of filmmaking. It has been around just as long as filmmaking has been around. The earliest criticism of a film came out in the 1900s. The first paper to publish a critique of a film was the Optical Lantern and Cinematograph Journal. Then the very first official movie review came out in Variety Magazine, which was founded in 1905, which published their first film review in January 19th of 1907. For two films, the French comedy short and Exciting Honeymoon, which I could not find online. I looked for it and there was nowhere to be found and the Western short film, The Life of a Cowboy, which I did find online. You can watch it on YouTube. I will leave the link in the description in case anyone wants to see it. Because films didn't really have much prestige at the beginning of the 1900s. Newspapers didn't really start hiring film critics until the 30s when film became more popular because sound was added to films now. So that introduced the talkies and the audiences began to grow. And then film criticism became popular in the 80s thanks to Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel when they started their TV show Siskel and Ebert at the movies. Film criticism has come a long way since the 1900s. You don't need to read a newspaper. You don't need to wait for Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel to tell you about the latest blockbuster. You can easily just go online on YouTube, TikTok, or go to an online publication like Rotten Tomatoes and read a review. I give you all of that background about film criticism because in today's episode, I'm talking to a film critic. His name is Nicholas Bell and he is a Rotten Tomatoes certified film critic. He is also the chief film critic at Ida Cinema, an online publication where he covers all types of films from small indie films to major film festivals and major blockbusters. And he is one half of one of my favorite film review channels here on YouTube, Fish Jelly Film Reviews. So please enjoy this episode with film critic Nicholas Bell. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Of course, it's it's my honor. I'm not used to being on this side of things. I know. I, I'm a fan of your channel and I subscribe and I really love your reviews. So oh, I was excited you. when you replied and you said yes. <laughs> oh, th I appreciate that. Thank you. What inspired you to be a film critic? Um, I mean, it, I, it's probably not a very interesting answer. I just I've always loved film. P before that, probably literature. But um, I think that I had started a my own blog back in the yeah. day in like two thousand seven or eight, and then I saw an opportunity to come up at a website that I checked out a lot looking for writers and I applied and they said, sure. <laughs> nice. Um, but at the time I lived in Minnesota, so it was kind of like DVD or Blu-ray reviews. But when I moved to Los Angeles, you know, you just have so much more access and things were yeah. a lot more, things were different then. There wasn't online screeners, you know, yeah. uh, 
back then. You had to actually be in the place and get on press lists. And but um, it was it was a combination of things. In short, to answer your question, it was um, propinquity and uh, opportunity, I guess. Nice. How was um, growing up in Minnesota as a film buff? Um, you know, my family was into film. Uh, like that was the thing we did together with my parents was rent movies a lot on the weekends, you know, back the VHS. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And it, but it was all like English language, American cinema. I probably wasn't introduced to uh, subtitles, the concept of foreign language cinema until I took a, a college class and it that's opened up a whole nother world for me. And then, you know, you're discovering all these great, uh, tours and other languages and it's you know like a like a a, a, a buffet uh and and you you know there's that point i think when you decide you love film where you dive in and if you really dive in you're kind of learning new things every day and i think that's what i like most about film is you can't know everything there's always something to discover uh but it, again to go back to your question there was film available. There was like a healthy, you know, depending on your family, because I grew up in northern Minnesota. Uh -huh. But by the time I went to college in the Twin Cities, uh, you know, there were tons of little interesting video boutique stores that are no longer available, you know, but you'd go in and they'd have stacks and stacks of VHS of weird cinema that you're discovering for the first time. Um, so it, in short, it was it was available. But I think across the board, it, things used to be more available in that very tangible way where you would go to a place and sift through things. Whereas, you know, now it's most things you can find somewhere. Yeah. Even if bootlegs on YouTube. And... <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I used to have to pay so much money to buy stuff that was only available in the UK or. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, I would, yeah, I, I was probably a little more extreme about some things, but it's a good, if you like film now, it's a good time to find things you like. I know everything is so easy now. There's like a million streaming service that you could find a, a, a movie in, Amazon. Oh yeah. If you, if you dig, you can find that kind of, was, usually, there are probably a couple things I haven't found that I've looked for, but you, you can usually find something somewhere. I, I know. I found, um, oh, I usually do the intro separately. Oh, sure. So I'm going, to, I was going, I'm doing like a little history on film criticism. And I found the one, the first film that Variety review. So, and that was in like 1907. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, yeah, what what did, that, that makes sense. Yeah. What did you study in school? Do you study film or writing? I was an English major, uh, and I, my thesis though was more film related. It was about the adaptation of Tennessee Williams' play Suddenly Last Summer. Um, so I was, by the time I had graduated with my bachelor's, I was already kind of headed in the direction of film. Okay. And you cover pretty much all the major film festivals. Do you have a criteria to cover each one, or how do you approach uh, covering? Uh, the festivals, like, do you expect more from Cannes as opposed to Tribeca? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely, the, you know, the top three, you know, would be Cannes, Venice, and Berlin. Uh, and, yeah, there's a certain level of expectation to, and I'm talking about the films that get into the, the competition that are they're competing with the jury for this major film award that is a distinction uh, that to many, especially, you know, over in Europe is, you know, especially the Palm d'Or at Cannes is means much more than uh, an Academy Award for Best uh -huh. Picture. Um, as for I'm I'm a completist though, so whatever is in competition at a film festival I'm going to, I'm going to watch everything that's in competition. Um, and then there's always inevitably a bunch of other films and sidebars that I'm making myself crazy watching as yeah as they come. You know, four or five, sometimes six films a day. I don't do six. It's very rare now. Uh, cause you, you know, you'll, you kill yourself doing that kind of a schedule. But, um, my criteria, I guess, is to see as much as I can while I'm there. Um, and as far as the U S goes, you know, Sundance, I, I think holds that slot as the most important kind of platform for English language, American indie filmmakers. But there, I, but you bring up Tribeca there, there are, you know, 
whenever I talk about film to people, they're like, oh, our city has a film festival. Almost every major city has their own little film festival. And if you like film, that's wherever you're living, that's a really good place to start. Uh, Because again, Minneapolis has a great film festival. It's usually films that are premiered elsewhere, played a bunch of other, like the film Uh festival circuit. Um, But it's a good place to start. You can find all kinds of it's a it's a way to find what's kind of con- being spoken about contemporary contemporarily um, that is traveling around the world these new artists usually that are um, being discovered for the first time but it, as far as criteria it's to to see as much as I can and yeah there definitely is a hierarchy though and it's reflected in who they allow to be to receive press accreditation and with Cannes specifically there's a hierarchy of press which dictates your access. Um, oh, yeah. And if you were on the lower end, that's a very frustrating experience because my first year I was the lowest tier a decade no. ago, and I wouldn't go back if I had to be subjected to that again. <laughs> they just announced their their lineup, I think. Where are you looking forward to any films from this year? Oh yeah, um, Jonathan Glazer. Uh, who's only directed three films previously, Sexy Beast, Birth, and um, Under My Skin. All three of those are phenomenal films, so he takes a long time between stuff. And I read the book that it's based on by Martin, Martin Amis. Um, I'm very excited for The Zone of Interest. Um, Jessica Hausner is this Austrian filmmaker I like a lot. She has a new movie called Club Zero. Um, of course, the Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon. I don't know. There's this... Uh, uh, Wang Bing has this, as I understand, it's supposed to be the first part of a much longer documentary series called, I think it's Jeunesse, or which would be Youth, I think. Um, I'm excited for that. I, I haven't even, oh, uh, Nuri Bilga Ceylan, the Turkish filmmaker, apparently is a four-hour movie. Yeah, I'm, I, so I'm excited, in short. There's a lot of good stuff there. Are, are you going to go or you're, you get the virtual stuff? Uh, can usually doesn't do any virtual, oh. uh, even during the the pandemic, kind of the pandemic years, because 2020, they didn't technically have uh, a festival. And then in 2021, they weren't allowed. I, I actually had to go there in 2021. And we had to test journalists had to test every day. They had to go spit in a tube uh, to be able to continue to have access. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I will be traveling there. Uh, it's it's a lot. That's a film festival where, especially the higher tier stuff, like competition items, there's no way you can get a, a screening link to that. Usually, you know, I'm sure some outlets do. Some outlets see some things ahead of time, and they have separate morning screenings for. The, there's a whole subterranean version of Can that goes on that most people don't even see unless you're invited to. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you have to go. You you really have to go to experience it. Uh, in your opinion, what makes a great film festival? Uh, it has to do with the curation. I, I think that there's a lot of focus placed on whatever the jury is awarding, and most juries give out trash awards. Uh, <laughs> I, I think um, that it, it's. I, I feel like a lot of juries try to make some kind of statement with the selection rather than choose what actually might have been, at least in my very humble opinion, uh, the most worthy of that distinction. Um, where I, I'm getting lost in thought. Where would uh, sorry? What was your question again? Uh, what makes a good film f- oh, uh, festival? Sorry, uh, it's okay. I have a tendency to ramble. Uh, you can <laughs> feel free to cut me off at any time. Uh, what makes a good film festival? The curation. Uh, I think once you start to go to film festivals, if you do, you start to notice there's a certain level of curation. You start to notice that. The programmers are taking care to choose things rather than just throwing everything together all at once. The, yeah. Whatever, the, like it's it's clear that some festivals, it's like we're taking whatever we can get our hands on because to have a premiere is a distinction. If it's the first, if this is the first time this is played here, that is good for us. Usually, depending on what it is, um, and the smaller your film festival, of course, the smaller that is to have happen. Um, but it, it, I think it's 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 in the curation and what's available. And just, like I said, as, if you do it a few years, a few editions, you you can tell. Like I used, I started out going to the Toronto International Film Festival as mm-hmm. a member of the public in 2007, and that was that that opened a whole new world for me. And that I get that talk about buffets. 
you know, they have, you know, sometimes upwards of 300 titles playing in their program. Oh, wow. It's impossible to navigate. And they're pulling, though, from all these other major film festivals and having notable premieres. Uh, usually it's Oscar buzz bait kind of stuff. Uh, but I've, it's a, I love the city. I love visiting Toronto, but that festival as itself doesn't really work for me as a way to experience it. It's too, it's too overwhelming. They do have a, a, a competition section, the platform program that's only four or five years old now, but it, it's just not the same. There's, there's too much going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and the curate and all of their different, uh, programs like, like they have something called special presentations, premieres, masters, wavelengths. All of them have their own specific midnight madness. They all have their own specific programmers, and you can tell there is care taken uh, in the curation of that. But there's also a sense of um, you can also get a sense of political correctness uh, by who is allowed to play places. And Can is a good example of that right now. In whether or not we're going to see Woody Allen or Roman Polanski yeah. show up there. Um, where really the only kind of last major film festival that doesn't seem to give a damn about any of that kind of stuff is yeah. Venice, but... Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, you were also part of the jury at the Cleveland International Film Festival, right? I was. How, I, uh, how was that experience being a jury member and analyzing those films? How do you approach ranking them or like, uh, giving them, evaluating them as opposed to when you're doing a review for a publication or like just covering a festival? That's a good question because, uh, yeah, that's a much different experience that I was excited in, to do and I would love to do more, uh, be invited to do more jury uh, duties if, if at other film festivals. But yeah, it, it's a different experience because you don't have to, it's not that you're not paying attention, but you're watching these films, and again, at, at this film festival, they had they had a couple of different juries, and I think I was on the Eastern European jury, technically. Uh-huh. So looking at a very specific handful, it was either eight or ten films, maybe a little, I don't remember now, and that was 2019. And uh-huh. then meeting with the four other people on that jury, each with kind of different opinions. So you can see how sometimes these awards are trash because you can you can see what kind of compromises people have to make based on yeah. how who has control if if somebody has the line share of control and how you kind of have to barter with each other like i'll give you this if we can avoid giving that because i hated that blah 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 um and the conversations i ha- remember having with people unrelated to the festival um i remember somebody saying something disparaging like oh so you sit here and you think you can judge people's films. It's like, well, you know, I saw it as a really great opportunity to give somebody ten thousand dollars because right. the winner, that was that was the top, that was what they won. And I think that if that's the approach you're looking at, uh, to me, that that is what's most meaningful in at, in my contribution to that experience. Yeah. But um, I enjoyed it, and I was proud of what we did give awards to in that specific little film festival but yeah it, it is a different experience and it's surprising you're you're gathered together with people that are either involved in film or you think like film and they you know have vastly different opinions yeah um how do you like manage like watching so many films because as a subscriber to your channel you, you guys are always putting out reviews how do you i'm sure you have to do reviews for the publications that you work for how do you handle your time? Like, it is def- <laughs> time management is definitely a component, and it's difficult. Um, and sometimes it it's chaotic, especially like leading right up to a film festival. At least what I put myself through. Because uh-huh. I'll, I'll, in covering weekly releases and working for a couple different outlets, I still want to watch like previous films from these filmmakers I haven't seen. I'll drive myself crazy, and then read the books if they're. Um, it it's time management, also not not setting unrealistic expectations for yourself, which is probably a harder lesson I've learned because I would always get up and be like, I'm going to make it through these three or four films today and write about these seven. And it's like, that, that that's just impossible. So you need to, <laughs> you just need to pace yourself and realize that it's not okay. It, it's okay to not watch everything. You don't have to. Yeah. Um, you can, and you can always catch up with stuff. It doesn't matter. Um, and I don't think you should think about like, oh, people are going to be 
because there's a commercial aspect to it. Like people are going to want to see me talk about this, but not all of these foreign, weird indie films. And I, I like to see it all. I like to talk about it all. So I, I don't know if that is the the measuring stick that I, that makes me decide what I cover or what I don't. Um, but but t- timing plays a part in what is able to get done for sure. I but know. you know, there's I don't remember his exact quote, but Francois Truffaut, who started out as a film critic. Uh, said like the perfect day was you read one or two books and watch three or four movies and it's like I I agree that's yeah that's the perfect day for me I know me too <laughs> yeah but... um I have a question I was watching your review for a thousand and one and you guys gave it a three three and a half so I think we both did three and a half but yeah yeah but uh so while I was watching it the way you guys were speaking about it I thought you're gonna give it a five star so sure. what makes a good film like a three what's the difference between a great film a five star review film as opposed to a good film a three three and a half film a three and a half film to me is that's pretty good like at, out you know not quite excellent like there are one or two things that maybe i would have liked a little different but they're usually more more than not is really great about the film a four star is like i'm probably very gun shy about giving perfect ratings because the website i started working for initially ion cinema it wasn't so much that it wasn't allowed it was just like you need to be i would i was trained very early on doing this that you have to be very careful with what you're giving five stars to because that sets it's kind of setting this precedent and a five Uh star means to me like there's absolutely nothing i would change about this film ever um like this is a perfect achievement of everybody that's involved in in this vision and because because film you know that's why i appreciate auteur theory but i don't really believe in it because every film is a collaboration and it reflects the pock marks of everybody's desires and and needs with what they brought to the project and sometimes those are jarring and at odds and sometimes that makes for a great film itself like that that's what camp is to me like this this sense of failed art like clearly everybody involved there was too much that they set out to do and they just failed at doing but then it's kind of funny uh <laughs> but uh it and that doesn't mean it's a bad film either uh it it's just that's a, that's that's why I don't like ratings or, you know, even Rotten Tomatoes too much and like tacking a percentage because there's so much in the, in the gray area, in the in the periphery to, to talk about. But yes, if you're condensing it to how did we come to like three and a half over this film that we kind of did rave about, it has like a fantastic central performance. It was also, you know, a, a little on the nose with the, the gentrification themes that, right. that I also really liked, but, a, you know, that I wish had felt not so obvious i wish that i had left that film per se thinking about it in different ways maybe i'm just kind of talking off the top of my head right now but or you know ari aster's recent film bo is afraid which our review hasn't dropped for that but you know and i've seen twice now that has sat with me for for days and i keep mulling over all of these small little things and and that has things that are on that seemingly on the surface but there are these these depths to it uh but yeah the in, in short it's also arbitrary a bit and uh that as everybody has everybody's a film critic i think they also yeah. if, if you're if you're have an opinion about something that you're critiquing it that that's yeah. your opinion it's just how much can you back it up and that's the, maybe the english language major in me uh that's that my argument is this and that's why i think that and it again it's just someone's opinion and and it can change too, you know. People don't realize like something for. Um, I, I've only recently joined Letterbox, but it's like you can go back and sh- you can watch something again and be like, "Oh, this is much better than I remember." Mm-hmm. Or because the situation, the conditions in, under which you watch something, are you panic watching something because you have to cover it in an hour and you've missed deadlines? Uh, is this your fifth film of the day and you're exhausted and you haven't eaten? That affects you know your your consideration of it and. Because I've talked to other people like Jessica Kiang at Variety, who's like, "Nope, my initial opinion, I was right. That's it. I don't revisit <laughs> things," which is great. Uh, that nothing wrong with that. But I do find that when I revisit things, especially growing older, something I've watched uh-huh. a decade ago, I'll have a wildly different, yeah, because of my life experiences. So, I I think that people 
when something's in print, it's in print and that's it. And it's almost set in stone. And there are pull quotes from critics on these movies. And it's like, you know, it would be interesting if someone had all the time in the world to go back and make these people revisit it and give their honest opinions. And do they feel the same? Anyways, <coughs> well, excuse well, me. That's okay. But with online now, you can go back and fix your reviews. Because I think I was reading this review. I forgot what it was, but it had a no, like this review has been rewritten X amount of times. Yes, and I, and I don't know if that's the way that I think things should be or, you know, people will think they'll publish something and think it's too incendiary so they'll go back and edit themselves, censor themselves. And I don't really love the notion of that either. I like more, I would like it more as an addendum of, sir, sure, spelling, grammatical, everybody sh makes those and should be allowed to correct them. But when it comes to opinion, you know, that's, it's part of the, the cultural conversation about that film and, the, and this is what I thought. And... I'm allowed, to, again, you should be allowed to change your opinion, but it's almost like if you're in some, if you're in algebra and the teachers like show your work, like show me how you came to change your opinion then, not just because you caved into peer pressure. Because yeah. I feel like a lot of film criticism now is people are afraid to seem stupid uh -huh. or that their opinion is stupid and uh, they want to fit in like like we all do in every kind of way it's just part of the human experience and it's like it's so much more meaningful to give your honest opinion even if it even if you're have some things wrong or uh, factually maybe about the film uh because we're all in ignorance about some things i don't know it's it, it's a, and it's okay to be wrong it's okay to not be liked i don't know I agree. Do you feel like film criticism is becoming less valuable, valuable or more? As because now anyone can just grab a camera and do a review online and post it on TikTok on YouTube. I think that is a good question because in my heart, I probably feel like it is less valuable, but um, it also puts the onus on who is seeking out the criticism because I think you need to. There, again, you, you should find people that you like whose opinions that maybe align with yours and that you trust, but it's also good to check out what other people think as well. Like, I I, I, I feel gun-shy about saying that, you know, only align yourselves with people that think the same as you because then you put yourself in a bubble and you never learn anything new. But, there, but there's something that's to be said about finding people curating. I, I, I think it's okay and it's great to curate several different people to watch or follow or listen or want to have conversations with because in it's not just film criticism but uh, you know in your own life with friends like i'm not gonna take this friend to see a marvel movie because they will just they, they will it, it's not going to be a decent experience or an art house film they they can't they won't read subtitles which drives me crazy about that person but they're still my friend uh this is this is it Yes, is it less valuable? But the other good thing about it, much like the number of people that are allowed to or able to get creative projects off the ground is different voices in film criticism. I mean, we need, it can't just be all, you know, and, you know, in LA, a lot of the people that I see at some of these major publications are white gay men. And it's like, well, it can't just be white gay men. Because uh, right. that lends itself to a different kind of cultural gatekeeping. We do need all kinds of different people and I'm interested, and and we need to foster an interest in what they have to think and say. But uh, there, there's value in that. Again, I, I think that we have a lot farther to go, and and I don't I don't know that we'll ever get there. Yeah. Uh, because we also live in a very kind of divided society that doesn't want to listen to people that have different opinions as they do, and it, I don't know. But I, at the end of the day, it's just about movies, so we should be able to play around a little more without being so serious sometimes. Exactly. And how do you deal with uh, negative crit uh, criticism or pushback? Like when you do a review that it's not a, a positive review, do you ever get pushback from the studios or directors or even your audience? How do you deal with that negativity? I've never had a studio reach out to me because I'm not that important probably, <laughs> but uh, I've had I've had producers and I've had, I've had actors, again, they're usually white men that will reach, they'll find me 
I've had people reach out to me on Facebook, on Instagram, and and basically be very unhappy with my opinion and try to try to not critique me, but more demean me and mm -hmm. how I don't know what I'm talking about. I think on YouTube there are a lot of comments, and my my husband who runs the channel with me sees a lot. He filters out a lot more of that. A lot of homophobia uh, if we don't say what people want to hear, uh, kind of thing, and really. You just can't be bothered, and because there's also a, a sense of it, it, it's not really real. Like somebody who's I don't even know who they are because they have no identifying information, no picture that feels emboldened to uh, say something hateful or nasty, which is different than constructive criticism. Where I do welcome, I do get things wrong. I'm not brilliant. I'm not a genius. I, I'm learning things too. Uh, or I, or. I have so much going on in my little brain that something came out wrong or I didn't pronounce a word right or I got somebody's name wrong perfectly. That that's, that's should all be part of the conversation. Um, and I do welcome somebody having a different opinion and sharing that, uh, again, if it's constructive, because that's the part that's fun about film is not, it's not a debate class. I'm not trying to change anyone else's opinion, but somebody else might have noticed something that's enlightening to me that I, w that I would not have seen and why would you want to shut that down so it's it's learning to find that balance of not giving a damn about the haters because they're and also growing up gay it's like I'm very, I'm very well used to people not liking me uh, mm -hmm. even even my own gay people for a b or c whatever it's just uh you just can't let it get to you which yeah I think, I think it's hard when you're starting out uh is it as a teenager, a young 20 something, and you've not been supported enough to feel sure about yourself. So it's very easy to, to give into that or then develop imposter syndrome. But it's just like, you just gotta go out there and do it. Just go out and write, just do it. Don't, you can't care about what the critics are gonna say of the critics. Like you establish your own voice and you can use that information, but if it's not useful to you, ignore it. I agree. And I like, that's what I like about you and your husband. You guys are honest. And uh, there's a lot of people, we live in a world that people censor themselves. So they're like too afraid to say their opinion. So that's why I like, that's why I've subscribed to you guys because you guys and you have a good chemistry and you're just honest about your opinion. Thank you. I appreciate that. And because, because we are, I think it's not that we're working hard to be authentic with you know when you're with somebody for so long you're we we're not we're just talking we're not even thinking about how we're probably coming across between each other sometimes but and we feel safe enough to say how we really feel to one another whereas you know if this is a somebody that's a stranger to me it's funny how you're already thinking about what you're gonna say a little ahead of time which i don't do with him <laughs> Which isn't the best all the time either. It's, uh, <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's okay to, as I've been saying, it's okay to challenge yourself. But I think we do, we do strive to be honest, even, but not hurtful. I mean, we probably both said things that seem bitchy or harsh because we have, but <laughs> uh, it's not always, in, some, sometimes that's to be funny. But um, I, I think at the end of the day, we're trying to be constructive and we, we're not watching things wanting to hate it. I think that's the important thing is we we want to be entertained we want to be excited we want to leave something feeling something positive not this is another waste of my time because of a b or c <laughs> um you're you've mentioned that you're writing on a screen you're writing a screenplay so you're a screenwriter as well uh can you share a little what you're writing and why inspire you to write that story well um I wrote a script during the pandemic that came very close to being made in Serbia and it was going to star oh. Fanny Ardant, which I I think that project is stalled now, but with the director that was attached to it, uh, it was going to be his feature debut. He's made some short films. We started talking in the background, like, let's, let's try to do something else. And then with Joseph, my husband, uh, we're like, let's, let's write a micro budget film, something we can, we can make for ourselves with limited locations. Um, I think between ourselves and the director, there's enough contacts to to make something worthwhile that's that that says something. And uh, I don't know how much I want to say about it yet because we're still 
it's okay. still being written, but it is it, it's meant to be kind of a psychological thriller melodrama with the the heavy queer components uh, that we want to be a little taboo. We want to we want it to feel a little like art house films used to feel yeah. from European auteurs. But again, those are all very high film is a collaboration and we'll see how it goes but that is where we're headed I, we since it's still being written and developed uh i don't know when we would even begin to think about location scouting or yeah. funding or anything but maybe sometime next year um but i, I hope to be done because i've only been working out on the weekends with a I keep getting interrupted by film festivals actually uh <laughs> i hope to be done writing it by the end of june at the latest but we'll see well good luck do Thank you, you have do you have a writing process whether it be for the screenplay or your reviews as i've grown older uh, i find that for creative writing outlining uh -huh. it, it, and you don't and also and not being so rigid either with that it, outlining sometimes you have the sense of the sense of the story where you want to go um outline that part of it or write that part of it and give yourself time you don't have to put so much pressure on yourself i think to have it to have it all set and allow things to shift because i used to be bothered at having to do different drafts of scripts or stories and sometimes you come up with something so much better by allowing yourself to do that um and be experimental even if it causes a cascade or ripple effect where you have to as has has happened to me where I've rewritten something basically from s start to finish Trump. but you can get really exciting results with that and I think that's a good exercise for film reviews um it's funny how I feel like psychologically I have to get through the first intro paragraph and then everything is kind of free flowing but for whatever reason and I don't I'm sure this is just me I always do synopsis last I yeah. hate I hate doing a synopsis I just <laughs> I just don't like doing it. It's just like I have to describe the plot of a movie in, in written form, which is non-spoiler. It's like I can't. I just feel my hands feel so tied by <laughs> synopsizing, which is why you know our YouTube channel is spoiler-free, or no, it is spo it's spoiler-heavy. And then Joseph, I make him do the synopsizing because I'm so averse to it. How I do it drives him crazy. But <laughs> I'm also a little scatterbrained. But. <laughs> Um, I've been doing a rapid fire question with everyone. Will you be up for it? It's a two minute rapid fire question round and it's all questions about you. Sure. Uh, let me start the clock. The number to beat is 18. God. Okay. <laughs> what's your favorite hobby or pastime? Reading. Uh, what's your favorite type of music? Oh, uh, electronic. What's your favorite movie of all times? Death and the Maiden. What's your favorite type of cuisine? Pizza. Most unique place you visited? Uh, uh, Warsaw. What's the most exciting thing you've ever done? Oh, uh, met Sigourney Weaver. Are you a morning person or a night person? Uh, night. What's your favorite thing to do on weekends? Uh, watch movies. What's one thing most most people don't know about you? Uh, that I'm uh, nice. <laughs> What's your biggest pet peeve? Oh, loud noises uh, when there don't need to be. <laughs> How many states have you been to? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe ten. How many countries have you been to? Oh, that's maybe eight. What's the name of the first movie you, saw, you you ever saw in theaters? Beauty and the Beast. Worst trip you've ever taken? Um, God. Tucson. <laughs> if you could only listen to one song for the rest of your life, what would it be? Um, Hung Up by Madonna. Uh, best advice you've ever received? To not take things so seriously. And the model of your first phone? Uh, a Nokia flip phone. Me too. Three words your friends will use to describe you. Uh, intense, uh, eclectic, and uh, loyal. 
What's your go-to karaoke song? Um, damn. You can answer. You can answer. Uh, my, my go-to is "Zombie" by Cran the Cranberries. Okay. Uh, you what? You're the winner at twenty. Okay. See. I, so <laughs> you're on it. <laughs> I tried. I'd like get, which is a, <laughs> a blessing and a curse. <laughs> you're the first one that has be beat an eighteen. Okay. Uh, and my last question for you, if you could go back in time and talk to your younger self before he moved to LA or went to college, what advice will you give him? Write more sooner, put that yourself out there. Who cares if people don't like it? Just do it. That's, and that's great. A, and that's, that's my advice to anybody. If you're thinking about doing something, you, you just need to do it. You just need to start. It's one foot in front of the other. I wish I had moved sooner. Um, yeah, and, and and travel more. Just and you don't need you don't need someone else to be with you. You can do it on your own. I that's great advice, and I agree hundred percent. Nick, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was it was an honor to be able to speak with you, and uh, yeah, I could talk about movies anytime. So uh, thank you for reaching out. Yeah. <laughs>